You are listening to the Casting Shadows podcast. This podcast is an extension of the Casting Shadows blog and the Runeslinger YouTube channel. All three are focused on role-playing games and how we play them. This episode continues our exploration, let's say, of the old RPG conversation about immersion, which... For my purposes, I like to split into a discussion of immersion and engagement. And here, in this episode, we'll talk a little bit about why that is, and if everything works out, we'll also listen and respond to some listener calls. Okay, let's get into it. As was briefly discussed in the previous episode dealing with the overall topic of immersion, I like to split that overall topic into two, that of immersion and engagement. Immersion can definitely suffice on its own as a descriptor, but there's that problem of the more things we apply a word to, the more likely we are to run into some problems of communication, or at least understanding of what really was meant by our communication. So for my purposes, I intentionally split this topic into immersion to cover the largely passive parts of the experience. And I don't mean that in a negative way, like you're not doing anything. I mean it in the receptive sense. Things like listening, you know, taking in description, uh, reading information in a handout, that kind of thing, the passive parts of the experience. And I use engagement to cover the more active parts of the experience, where we are declaring the decisions that we're making. We are making actions, we're acting and interacting. Whereas immersion largely, I think, covers reacting. So for example, I might recognize that a session was immersive if I had, because I imagine things quite visually as a, as a lead, hence the word imagination. If I had a strong visual sense of the character's surroundings, then I have a tendency to describe this as an immersive experience, right? If I have a a clear mental picture of an NPC or a strong sense of a a smell, like if I enter a musty cabin, right? These are immersive things for purposes of discussion. Whereas in contrast, I might recognize a session was engaging if during a combat scene, the, the rolling of the dice, as I've described before, connects with me on a more fundamental level. I'm not rolling dice to see what the number is to then decide if I was able to hit and do damage. I'm instead striking my opponent. That die roll is striking my opponent, right? It's not a system by which I can figure out if my strike hit and hurt the opponent. It's connected. I'm engaged with it on more than one level. I have my sense of how the dice work and how the systems work, but I'm also strongly imagining what that means in the imagined situation. I am fully engaged. And so these two things are separate enough, right? My perception of my imagined experience of a conversation in a quiet dining room compared to my imagination of a brutal battle on the side of a hill. Right, One of these can be immersive, while the other can be engaging. And by separating the terms, I can make it easier to talk about them. Of course, the whole thing is still the overall topic of immersion. So through these two personally defined lenses, I can come to view the same experience based on what is happening when that experience has been recognized 
as occurring. When thinking about a session, we can consider moments where we were or were not immersed, as well as moments where we were or were not engaged. And then we can examine, like I like to do, why. By making the distinction, we can isolate more of the experience of a moment and examine what matters to that experience with fewer details to distract us. And this lets us explore the phenomenon more effectively for those gamers who find themselves better able to respond to specific parts of play than other parts of play. I mean, what I'm defining as immersion and engagement, I feel, can commonly be experienced by most players. And yet this is still a, a spectrum of experience. And so some of the people we play with respond more strongly to the inputs that I have covered by the label of immersion, where others respond more strongly to those covered by engagement. And by being able to isolate those details that way, we can see that spectrum more easily and therefore you know, zero in on the changes we might need to make to our play to get more of what we as a group want. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Immersive RPG experiences, as I like to categorize, categorize them, often revolve around the feeling of being there or at least of being able or almost able to see, to otherwise sense the imagined situation, right? What some people call the fiction, the imagined situation. Our play is creating, our description is shaping, our decisions are shaping, right? Our actions, reactions, and interactions are creating a situation an imagined situation. So the descriptions and the personal knowledge of the setting, the relationships of the, the characters, our understanding of where we are, what we're carrying, what we want, right? All of these things can spark, I'm going to use the word visualization, but as some of us maybe don't actively or passively visualize, but we can still conceptualize a situation, right? We find that all of these things merge together to be that spark, right? That sense of being there, particularly in hindsight as memory. We can look back on the session and interspersed with our memories of playing the game are kind of sense memories of having experienced that imagined situation. Now engaging RPG experiences often revolve around personalizing those memories but of action. Right? No real blows were launched and struck or missed but we can feel, or maybe almost feel, depending on where we fall on this spectrum, almost feel the impact of it in our memory. The mechanisms of play and the different tools that we use, like dice or cards or a VTT or whatever, all of these things rapidly and like subliminally or subconsciously inform us of all the things, all the changing conditions in that imagined situation our play is creating, right? We're active, we're leaning in, we're making decisions, we're talking to other players, we're rolling dice, we're checking character sheets or whatever, and all of this stuff becomes not all those separate experiences, but one experience of the imagined situation. We are fully engaged with the unreal. <laughs> When looking back on immersive play, our memory can include things like 
images of what the character saw as if we saw it. And we might remember dialogue as if it had been spoken to us, or we might feel an echo of emotions that the character probably felt if, well, could have felt if they were real. And our senses, our attention, and the sensory input we imagine in play interacts in our memory of that play experience, and it leaves us with a sense of having been or almost having been there. So most discussion of immersive experiences seem to revolve around the in-character perspective, immersing in character, and maybe even the identity of the character. But it's entirely possible and quite common, just less talked about, to find the scene or the scenery to be immersive. Or for some types of players or some players, the, the sense of story elements merging together into a richer or more surprising or more satisfying tapestry of story can be immersive. Where our attention can find purchase for focus, there too can immersion be found. Now, when looking back on engaging play, our memories are no less vivid, let's say, but they, are, they, they arise from what we are doing as players of the game. And it's in this kind of experience we get the other reference most commonly made about these immersive play experience, and that is the sense of losing track of time or perceiving time differently at any rate compared to other considerations, right? We become so focused on the imagined situation, what's happening within it, that the real world around us fades in significance or fades in consequence, right? We become more in tune with the rate of time or the, the other physical details of the imagined situation. We become more aware of those than we do of the real world. And that's ultimately what we're talking about. Attention. So, immersive experiences and engaging experiences are different expressions of our ability and our desire to focus on some aspect of play. Right? What attracts us? What holds our attention? What responses can we have and what responses do we have from paying particular attention to a particular part of play and how broad can our attentiveness be or how focused or how fragile is it really or how durable can it be how can our attentiveness to play produce that sense of immersion or that sense of engagement in play or in hindsight afterward. If we want more of it or want it to happen more consistently, what do we have to do or what do we have to stop doing to get it? And that, I think, is a worthy thing to discuss. <music> As was mentioned in the preceding episode, I've been running Call of Cthulhu lately with some cool people and the game is going well, but it has resurrected some of these discussions such as distractions caused by the use of system during play that should be immersive by my definition, right? The, the act of asking for or making a role obviously has an effect on how immersed you might be. And it offers opportunities for engagement, but it might just be distraction. A lot of that depends on the individual. Some of it depends on the interactions between the individuals as players and as characters. So a lot of things to think about and explore and discuss. This episode will not be about that, but it's coming. 
And it will also link way back a few episodes ago to the episode about layers of play. So in context of what we can engage with or immerse in, that's where layers of play takes on more significance and has, has a, a bigger bite on the conversation. But like I said, this episode is not that. It's time instead to start listening to Collins. My initial conception for this episode was to make it a bookend to the previous episode on immersion and engagement and just have two episodes to kind of serve as a survey for the whole topic. But I've come to realize that that's just not practical. The episode would be far too long, even if it was just me sharing my ideas. And where I've invited people to participate in the conversation would make the episodes extraordinarily long, even by my standards. So it's going to be multiple episodes. This episode is going to focus on what we've just discussed, the clarification of why it might be helpful to separate the, the idea or the discussion of attention as immersion or engagement and the relative fragility or durability of that experience. So, to, spe to specifically focus on those aspects, one of the calls that I received was from Safer, of Safer Fantasy Crafting. It's quite a meaty call-in. And what I've decided to do is, as he's very organized in his presentation of his ideas, is I'm going to split it up between each of his points and put in my responses or insert my responses into the flow of his message. So hopefully that will be easier for everyone to follow, turning it into almost a conversation. Anyway, without further ado, let's segue to Safer. Hello, Anthony. It's just Safer here. Um, I just want, I'm just calling, I know I promised you something on your Immersion uh, podcast, which I enjoyed greatly. Um, I apologize for the delay in your, in my response. Uh, I was a little bit hesitant to reply because I wasn't quite sure if I could articulate my thoughts properly. And I've had some other things to deal with as well in the real world. But uh, please accept my apologies. I'll hopefully try to be as concise as I can and not waffle, even though I'm doing that right now. Right. First of all, I wanted to say how much I appreciated your podcast because I valued some of the ideas and concepts that you had and I thought they married some of my own ideas uh, uh, regarding Che's and Daniel's approach to immersion. The fact that you recognised that immersion could be robust and resilient to distractions and perhaps even easy to acquire uh, was something that I recognise and feel for myself. Although immersion can be fragile uh, and easily broken, it can also be robust and resistant and easily acquired as well. I also like the way that you broke immersion down into different aspects, as in immersion into place, immersion into character. And what you described as immersion into play, which I'm not 100% sure what you mean by that, but I suspect what you mean is possibly the flow state, immersion into focus. I think that's what you're getting at that. You'll have to correct me if I'm wrong there. I left some comments on Che's blog about uh, his experimentation into immersive uh, methodologies and I don't want to go over them again here but I will just say that um, although I have a slightly different opinion to Che, I value his and uh, Daniel's investigations into the process. I'm really appreciative of the work that they've done in trying to find an immersive technique for themselves and for others. And as I said, I have a different approach to it which I think immersion I think they've assumed that immersion is fragile and difficult to acquire, whereas I think immersion can be robust and easy to acquire. 
I, I'm not opposing their opinion. I value it. I think I have a slightly what is considered a sort of antithetical approach to theirs, not in the hope of opposing their work, but in the hope of perhaps synthesizing some of their attitudes, because what I really would like to see, and I think your podcast might be a useful place to do it, is to explore methodologies and techniques for acquiring immersion. That being said, though, I do have to say that the crux of the matter ultimately personally for me is that I think immersion is an, a very personal thing. I think it's something that is different for each person individually and I think it is therefore the responsibility of the individual to take or make the immersive experience for themselves. I don't believe that it can be really a truly shared experience nor frankly would I want it to be. I wouldn't want anyone else taking responsibility for my immersive experience and I wouldn't blame anyone for my ability to immerse or not immerse in a game. I think it's a very personal thing that I do for myself. I'm perhaps a bit selfish in that. First of all, thanks very much for the kind words and please, Safer and anybody else, never worry about delays in producing a reply for one of the episodes of the podcast. And certainly don't apologize for responses that aren't brief. If we produce anything on this podcast and on the YouTube channel, it's delays and <laughs> and content that is not brief. So it would be hypocritical of me to get bent out of shape by a meaty call-in like this one. I'm quite pleased to get it. In response to your point about the personal responsibility to immerse, there's two things that I want to tease out from that. One is that I definitely think that if we care about immersion or engagement as experiences, if this is something that we are seeking, then yeah, I agree that we need to be doing something to make it more likely. At the same time, typically we're playing in a group and I cannot guarantee that I'll be able to meet my needs as a player if some other player in the group is intentionally doing things which will disrupt it, whatever that might be. Meaning that if the person across the table from me is playing very casually and, and doing things that is disruptive, it has an effect on my ability to concentrate and focus, right? If the player across the table from me is highly focused on wanting to use the system and the person across the table from them is highly focused on wanting to have extensive and detailed role play, there are frustrations that may build up related to the amount of time spent doing the thing that you came there to do, if you see what I mean. So as a group, we have a responsibility to the group. And as a player, you have a responsibility to that group. And as a player, you have a responsibility to yourself. But all of these things are about the active pursuit of creating conditions that are amenable to these types of experiences. But when we first start out in play, eventually we're going to discover immersive experiences. And sooner or later, we may recognize that we are having them. It's not always the result of an active pursuit. It's the experience of the right conditions everybody paying attention, everybody enjoying what's happening, everybody, you know, moving in the same direction, so to speak, in terms of play. And the experience is immersive or our play is engaging. It's not always conscious, though it may become so once we become aware of wanting to have that experience again. But to deal with the elements that you said in your podcast and your individual things, I think, for me, Otherworld Immersion does contain both the concepts of immersion into character and immersion into place. Immersion into process or flow, I think, is slightly different. 
or at least my initial thoughts were that it was slightly different. Since I've had a chance to think about it, I've now become developed an antithetical position to my initial thoughts in the hope of perhaps synthesising a new thought from that as well. Uh, but my initial thoughts were that superficially immersion into flow uh, and immersion into character and immersion into place, or what I'm going to call other world immersion, superficially appear similar because they're both retreats into your own mind, into your own head. But I think they differ in one key way. Both immersion into place and immersion into character, for me at least, typically involve an attempt to at least maintain my full conscious faculty and thoughts and perceptions and feelings and then project them into an imagined fantasy state. That's other world immersion. But immersion into focus, immersion into flow, typically involves the reduction of uh, your conscious faculties down to a very narrow limitation. So it's about whittling away distractions and other parts of your consciousness and your, your mind and your experiences, cutting away your hearing, focusing perhaps just on your vision, if you're an artist doing a painting or something like that, in a way that is effectively meditative, almost trance-like. In that way, flow is staying in the real world but limiting your experience down to a very narrow focus. Most people find this very therapeutic. And I initially thought this was very different to the other world immersion, which is at least maintaining your conscious faculty and thoughts and sciences and putting them into this fantasy world, even to the point of actually extending your conscious perception in the way, say, like casting a, a lightning bolt spell is something you can't do in the real world. So imagining the feeling of, say, a, a tingle forming in the front of your head, the idea of perhaps an electrical current passing on either side of your skull across your ears and gathering at the base of your skull, feeling the building energy up at the top of your spine and then suddenly feeling that energy release down your spine, splitting across your shoulders, surging down your arms and exploding out of your fingertips in a crackling roaring blast of energy it rocks you back slightly perhaps in surprise and perhaps smelling the ozone of it even the sense of fear that perhaps this could have backfired on you and feel it in your mind's imagination that expansion expansion of conscious experience into an imagined state is quite different to the narrowing of your conscious state in the real world which is typically what flow is i really like this description of an experience that we have never and likely will never be able to have, right? Casting the lightning bolt spell and what that would feel like and what senses other than the visual, right? When we imagine imagining things, just by definition, it's tied to imagery, but our senses are fully a part of experiences that we can imagine. Now, I think of what you're describing here as like, a greater step into controlling how and what we imagine, becoming better at imagination, right? The, the base level of imagination is tied to memory. We draw on our experiences and we can imagine variations on things that we have experienced. We've gone mountain climbing. We can imagine climbing a different mountain, or we can imagine climbing our familiar mountain, but with people that we've never climbed with. We can imagine conversations ending differently because we say things that are funnier or more caustic or definitely better than what we said in real life and that sort of thing. That's the baseline of like interpersonal imagination. What you're describing takes us into a more active realm. We imagine sensations, we imagine sounds and scents and reactions in the emotional context, but also in the interpersonal context that we have no familiarity with, we can have no familiarity with. And a lot of the different role-playing games that are out there to be played kind of, in a sense, are enriched or maybe even require this type of imagination to be able to go beyond and give yourself more of the experience than simply conceiving of it, right? What is it like to land on an unexplored 
planet with just your small exploratory research vessel and a handful of crew members to back you up, right? What is that like? Sights, sounds, sense, that sense of isolation, that sense of discovery, all of those things. Where does that come from? Now we can play a game that, re that gives this experience without trying to imagine in this way, but it will be a different experience. But all of this is separate, related, but separate to the topic of attention that becomes immersion or engagement. In order to become immersed in this experience, either through the eyes of the character who's landing on that world or casting that spell, or in the scene or the understanding of that happening requires being able to imagine it in the first place. And then to be able to do so with the facility that we can step away from the, let's say, mental effort it takes to do it in order to be able to direct that effort into being able to pay such close attention to it that other interests and concerns drop out of focus. However, since I've had a chance to think about it, I've realized that many of the techniques that I actually use to acquire my immersive state in a game involve trance-like meditative actions. And I think that we can use um, the flow state, not actually as part of uh, other world immersion necessarily, but as a way of making other world immersion more robust and resilient, taking the elements of focus and narrowing of uh, thought down to a particular uh, focus can help us resist all those uh, immersion breaking things that Che and Daniel have experienced. As an example, one of the techs I, techniques I use is, um, I call it mini LARPing, which is slightly embarrassing. Basically attempt for me to surreptitiously um, mime the actions of my character. At a real table situation, this was done to try and prevent the other players realizing what I was doing, and so not embarrass myself. I don't think I actually hid it from anybody, though. But it was an attempt to get that boon of uh, the nervous system, that two-way feedback system of the nervous system, make me feel like I was in a place doing the activity that uh, was being described to me or by me. And typically this involves my typical little mimes, almost like kalinetic movements. It's typically a repetitive action that I'll do repeatedly over and over again, which is very much like the meditative trance-like actions of someone acquiring a flow state. As an example, I used it in a game of Barney Dick as Alluvial Plains when I was playing the part of a teenage Neolithic boy, a part of a clan, who had just seen his father murdered. I found his father's dead body in a copse, not quite a wood, but a load of shrubs. His, uh, the father's character was played by Spike Pit, and I'd found his body with his throat slashed. And we'd gone to the head of a... A, f a tribe of butchers who we suspected one of their clan was responsible for the murder. And I was playing with Spencer Game and with Andy Goodman. Spencer was my grandfather and Andy Goodman was an ally of our family. And they were we'd been invited into this house of butchers and it was led by a matriarch, which we'd call Tap Butcher, as a little joke towards EastEnders, UK TV soap opera. But while Andy and Spencer conducted the interrogation with Barney as, the, uh, as Tap, head of this opposing tribe I was sitting in the background imagining the environment that I was in and in, in terms of emerging into place I'd got it all wrong this was the Neolithic period it was meant to be a yurt of some kind we would have been sitting in a tent surrounded by skins and perhaps sitting on the floor with a fire in the middle of the, the yurt somehow in, my, somehow in my mind I had imagined we were sitting in a dark age Watlin Dob hut with a large roaring fireplace. And I was imagining the orange glow from the fire on the walls and on the roof, casting long shadows across the floor, imagining the harsh contrast of the bright orange firelit side of each of our faces, contrasting with the dark shadow side. And I was hearing the crackling of the fire and feeling the warmth. And I started to mime holding this bowl of soup that I'd been given, but I wasn't eating it because I didn't trust this person. But I was miming holding, I was sitting at a desk in the real world, but I was miming holding the bowl in my left hand. And with my right hand, I was pretending to pinch the rim of the bowl and spin the bowl round and round and round, repeatedly in a very annoyed fashion. 
And as I listened to um, my fellow teammates interrogate uh, Barney and getting nowhere with the negotiation as Barney just put them off and led them up the garden path, I felt the irritation of my character building with inside of me and the repetitive, irritated, annoyed spinning of the bowl continued and continued in a very meditative way till I got myself into such a frenzy that I just blurted out against all table etiquette right in the middle of uh, someone else's conversation a challenge to the head of the, uh, the, the other tribe not a physical challenge but I just challenged all the horse shit that she was coming out with and I wouldn't let it go I kept asking her things to catch her out and in the end, I think Barney threw me a look. We were playing over Zoom, and I could see him throw a look in his camera to say, like, will you just shut up? But I'd worked myself into this immersive state of immersion into character and a quite incorrect immersion into place. And I'd done it quite quickly and quite easily, and I was feeling the immersion very strongly. But that resilience and that ease actually created a problem at the table because I broke table etiquette. I broke the meta rules of gaming. I think there can be problems to this approach. But I've now realised that part of what got me into the deep state of immersion into character was that repetitive, meditative, trance-like, flow-like uh, use of the mime. So now I start to think that perhaps, as you say, flow, immersion into play, immersion into focus, immersion into flow can be used or can be a, part, a significant part of uh, this other world immersion that we are seeking. I think stories like this are invaluable and I'm really happy with all of the detail that was included, right? Mistakes that were made uh, and what was involved in the experience, like emotional or visual or auditory and, and that kind of thing. Like revealing the strength of the sense of imagination or at least the strength of the remembered imagination because of course we can't really trust all the details of memory so this seems like it's a story of a very immersive experience now the question we're asking ourselves across these episodes is how do we get there or how can we hold on to it despite things like interruptions and safer provides us with some interesting answers such as connecting more of our physicality to this primarily mental aspect of imagination and using that to bolster immersion. Now he describes being able to reach this state, this focused state on the imagined situation as being easy. And I might want to challenge that. I don't know him. I haven't played with him. But I might challenge the notion that it's easy. Not that it's not easy for him now, but that it's easy for him as a result of this refined and controlled imagination. That the first step was choosing to improve his imagination. And then as a result of this vivid imagery and sensory input and emotional input, then an immersive or engaging experience became easy. On top of that, we have the physical elements, the meditative motions that he describes, which further enhance the sensory input to the imagination and therefore bolster that imaginative, that immersive property to the imagination. I could go on and give other examples. I've already taken far too much of your time. But I just want to finally comment on something you mentioned about the transience of the experience. And I'm glad that is a transient experience because I would be hate to be trapped in a daydream. For me overall, I think the key to role playing is not just immersion. It's not about focusing on just one of the influences or aspects of the game or trying to maintain a particular frame of trying to maintain like the character frame or the GM player frame or the mechanical frame. Role playing game role playing games are hybrids to me. And the magic occurs when we are able to sit in the middle of all the influences and move easily between them. 
I think the I think the magic of role playing occurs when we're able to almost effortlessly and fluidly move between the different influences without feeling that cognitive cost that Che describes. Personally, I think we're playing a game, so the cognitive cost is not that critical. I think, but I think it can be almost um, irrelevant at times. And this is an interesting point, and it's not one with which I disagree. But I feel that this topic of attention and the various things into which we can immerse or various things with which we can engage, I do feel that like many other experiences we have in life, there is a, a spectrum of reactions to the available inputs. And so there are those among us who may find that they only receive a strong sense of immersion or engagement from play that provides them with an in-character, as-character experience. And we'll talk about that more in a later episode. But other layers of play just simply don't grab their attention or they are just not as interested. And so they don't bring their attention to bear in such a way that it will trigger an immersive or engaging response. It doesn't matter what the thing is that triggers them, but they respond to a narrower focus than I would say the average gamer tends to do. Then, if they have developed a habit of paying attention to singular things in play, such as the system, or the camaraderie, or the characters, or the story. If they've developed that habit, they will maintain that habit and will seek that habit. But some people form their habit of paying attention to the experience of play. The interactions of the players as players, the interactions of the players as characters, the roll of the dice, the turning of pages, the invoking of rules, the description, all of it. And they become immersed in playing. All of those disparate elements merge into one element, play. They're not particularly imagining things through the eyes of their character. They're not particularly imagining how various story threads are being formed by their decisions and interactions. They're not particularly focused on how all of those different story threads are becoming a much broader story of their game as a whole. They're not particularly paying attention to someone's posture at the table or what joke or Monty Python reference was made. They are scanning all of it, and they are 100% engaged with it. You asked me earlier in your message, what did I mean by immersed or engaged in play? And this is what I'm talking about. I'm sometimes able to reach this state, but my preference is for in-character as character play, and that's mostly what I focus on trying to facilitate in the games that I run for people who want that experience. But in my life, I have played in some pretty awkward and bizarre situations like driving a car, a crowded coffee shop in, in one of the most populous cities in the world and that sort of thing, and have still found the play to be immersive. Just I've been immersing in play itself rather than in character. And so so this is where we run into the notion of durable 
and fragile states first, I think. This is one of the great places to encounter this topic. Because what we choose to pay attention to and then what that allows us to ultimately immerse in or engage with will determine what kind of obstacles we encounter. And so a very durable focus for that immersive or engaged state is to connect with and pay attention to play. A die roll is not going to break me out of it. A joke is not going to break me out of it. It's a part of everything. And a real-world example that I might present of this behavior different from gaming is bouncers. Now, I've worked with some who, when somebody enters the space, it sets off some alarm bell for them, and they become very vigilant of that single person to the exclusion of a lot of other things that are going on around them, right? They, they focus solely on that person and what they might be doing that's going to, you know, disrupt the fun in the venue. Whereas others that I've worked with survey the room, not looking at individuals, not even really being aware of individuals, but seeing the crowd as an individual. And then when some disturbance happens within the crowd, they're aware, they notice, and they move in and can do their jobs. Now, both of these types are effective. It's kind of obvious from my description which type I prefer to work with. But the point stands. We can focus on single details and become very aware of exactly what that person is doing, where they are, who they're with, what kind of threat is imminent, and so move to prevent disaster. Or a broader sense of awareness, largely in touch with everything that's going on on a superficial level and able to respond to it with swift action. As an example, if you listen to my podcast, uh, Make Believes and Minis, I think, it's a little uh, live play between me and my nephew, where my nephew was playing as the GM. And in that, he effortlessly moves between... We take up... a taboo subject we my nephew had a, a in a player character within the team which i now understand is something of a taboo uh, subject a taboo technique and i understand why because i used it in the 80s and i did abuse it after although initially bring using it for virtuous intent i did end up uh, misusing it and i and I understand that uh, such techniques can be used for, for a gm to railroad players and dominate the play too much but my nephew had a character, a halfling character, who was a thief sidekick to my fighter character. And he was effortlessly moving between the different frames of play, between the GM layer, into the character layer, and into the mechanical layer. He was actually more reluctant to go into the mechanical layer, and I was having to bring the game to the mechanical layer on occasion. But the fact that he had a player character in the party meant that many of the interactions that should have been that would have normally been taken at the GM player layer of interaction, we were able to conduct at the character-to-character -character layer of interaction. So we were able to stay in the character-to-character -character layer of interaction more than we would in a standard game. I was sometimes a little bit confused. Sometimes I would think that my nephew was moving into the GM layer of play or frame of play, but, but he wasn't. You know, he was actually staying in the character frame. So there's a few moments like when I was... We discovered a chest in the hut of a uh, of a camp of a group of orcs that we were attacking. If my nephew mentioned a key on one of the orc bodies, and I thought he was talking in the sort of GM frame, and that I had to go and search the bodies, but he wasn't. He was still talking as the player character. So there's a f so there's a few moments where I'm having to catch up with him, but it doesn't spoil the experience. We were naturally, intrinsically, intuitively moving between different frames of play between in-character frame, GM frame, and mechanistic frame, with almost, uh, without any real effort to it. And it was very natural and very fluid, and it was very pacey, and it was frankly some of the best role-playing I've ever done. So I don't know if you want to give it a listen and see what you think. As I say, it's very naive. We're using 5e, but we're really ripping the rules apart. And it's very loose. I think it'd probably be far too loose for some people. But I really enjoyed it, and I think that is the key, not just... 
not just about trying to maintain a particular frame of play, but actually finding ways to make the movement between frames of play more frictionless. I'm not sure that might be an extra consideration compared to immersion, but I think this is all somehow related that I haven't quite defined in my mind yet. It's definitely related. And we're bringing this up in a subsequent episode. But anything that gives us friction, as you say, will impact our ability to be attentive, right? And we start having to exert some effort. And this is related to the idea of code switching or switching costs, right? As we pay attention to things which are relatively similar, like a conversation in the real world and a conversation in the imagined situation. So a conversation between players as players, not about the game, a conversation between players as players about the game and a conversation between characters in the game. If we're trying to pay attention to all of these things, our attention is spread and spread to the point where we may not be as effective at getting all of the nuance from all three conversations as we might like. <laughs> now, if my intent is to be able to focus on the character, then those other two conversations are definitely distractions that will impede me in my pursuit of focus, which will then enable me to immerse. Right. When I think back to how we played as kids and all the interruptions and all the uncomfortable situations that we played in, like walking to school and stuff like that, then I recognize that at a point, after experiencing so many games that involved so many disruptions, we became better able to switch our focus. It became less demanding. Now, that could be the trickery of memory. But at the same time, I've discovered in my pursuit of understanding how we learn, how it is that multiple concepts can be distilled down and take a new form as one concept and then are easier to handle. And I find parallels and similarities to that in play, which is what you're describing. I love this description of your play and how you tie it in to the layers of play and Che's mention of frames. Like I said, we'll talk about this in another episode. But sharing this kind of experience and giving it context, I think, is essential if we're ever going to move conversations like this one forward into more practical realms than complaining about having it or not having it or not believing it's real or, or whatever. So I really thank you for sharing this example. And I'm hoping that the current Call of Cthulhu campaign that I'm running with some very cool people will contribute in some way like your example here does. So what I think I'm trying to say is that for me, Otherworld Immersion is just part of the experience, something that I want to be transient, something that I enjoy dipping in and out of at will, something that I normally perform in the background when I'm not actually interacting with the GM or the other characters. And I actually enjoy all the other elements, all the mechanistic elements and personal, interpersonal, play at a player level interactions as well. For me, that is the full magic of the game. It's about everything. It's not just about focus on one particular element. I enjoy immersion. I find it easy. I find my experience quite robust. And I'm not just being glib about that because I recognize that other people might find it fragile. And that actually having a robust immersion can be problematic in a game. It's something I need to deal with and measure correctly. But it's only part of my experience and enjoyment at the table. It's not the be-all and end-all for me. I'll leave it there. Then, Anthony, I think I'm getting a bit off topic here. I've already taken up far too long. This is 16 minutes long, this message. 
But thank you for the podcast. I really enjoyed it. I hope this is something you can use. And I hope you can explore the subject on your podcast further. And perhaps your podcast can be used as a hub for exploring these techniques and perhaps developing a methodology or considering new synthesized methodologies on what immersion is and how it can be achieved. Take care. All the best. Thank you. Once again, we are in agreement, not the be all end all for you, nor me. But I have played with people for whom it's either extremely important or it's the driving force behind why they play. They will form friendships just like everybody else and they will come to value the group. But in the beginning, when they join a new group, that's the reason they joined in order to have an immersive or engaging experience. And again, it doesn't matter what kind, whether that's immersion in character or immersion in being a part of an emerging story or being a part of consciously shaping a story, fighting it out of all the chaotic elements that happen in gameplay. So, right on. Thank you very much for taking the time to record this. And that brings us to the end of this episode. The next episode, we'll take a look at the layers of play and how they directly connect to immersive and engaging experiences. And for that exploration, we're going to go back to Dark Fluid's call from an earlier episode and look at the concept that he put forward of things that work for and against our immersive experiences. We'll also bring in some ideas raised in responses and video responses that appeared on YouTube and tie them in with the Call of Cthulhu campaign that I keep mentioning. You've been listening to an episode of the Casting Shadows podcast. You can find us at castingshadowsblog.com. You can find us here, wherever it is that you have found this podcast. And you can find us at YouTube, at youtube.com slash runeslinger. To interact with us and become a part of the conversation, visit SpeakPipe at Casting Shadows Podcast. All the links for how to contact me will be in the show notes. Until the next time, Take care.